Welcome to Homeschool Mama Self Care. I'm Teresa Wiedrich at CapturingTheCharmLife.com. I'm here to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you are a homeschool mama looking for a strategy or a few for your self care, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I get to introduce you to Megan Jackson of Joyful Mud Puddles. Megan is a parenting and homeschool coach. She's taken her passion for bringing peaceful calm to family life and pairs that with her background in education to help parents become more confident and well-equipped. Megan has a Bachelor of Education in Engineering, along with several years of teaching experience at a private school. Since having children, she has homeschooled her three boys and is an advocate for the homeschool community, organizing events and leading classes. As a successful business owner and entrepreneur, Megan understands the difficulties that many parents go through trying to juggle it all. Her family struggles and transformation is what led Megan to become a parenting coach because she desires for others to rediscover the joy in parenting. What better way to describe the messy, fun, exciting life of a mom with three boys than joyful mud puddles? I am so happy that I can introduce the listeners to you, Megan. I get to introduce you, a homeschool mom and coach. You are a homeschool mom of three boys. Would you tell me about your homeschool experience? Oh, sure. Well, my journey is an interesting one. I actually used to be a teacher. And then when I had my first child, you know, they always say children change everything, but it really is true because I fell in love with this little baby and I thought to myself, why is somebody else spending all day with my child and I'm spending all day with somebody else's children and this just doesn't make sense to me. And I was also already getting more and more frustrated being in the system because I couldn't give my students what they really needed I was always tied to what I had to be doing. Right. So, so that was, that was the beginning of me thinking that there's gotta be something else. So I decided to be at home. I was gonna supply teach and that didn't work out. And then when my son got a bit older and I had another child as well, and he just didn't seem ready for kindergarten. He was a very sensitive child. And I thought this is just like throwing a lamb to the wolves. He's going to get, picked like this is just not right and in our area kindergarten's actually optional it's not required so I thought well we'll just keep him home for kindergarten and wait till he's a little older and a little more you know sure of himself and he's 12 and he's never been to school (laughs) every year we assessed it and you know we've had some struggles as a family and, and school was definitely on our minds but every year we go into this and we're like, wow, I can't imagine not homeschooling. It's been great for us. So your experience as a teacher, that's a precedent to how you engage your kids as a homeschool mom. What would you say the difference between the two are? I actually had to unlearn a lot. I I would say I de-schooled and thought right out of the box. I do not teach my kids the way a teacher would at all. And I was already sort of like, Miss Frizzle. I was a science teacher, so I was already a little off beat from what the school, you know, mindset was. And I really just found like it just was seeing how kids learn on their own and in a home environment is so different that I really went and because I have that, you know, lifelong learner mindset, I just relearned everything and changed how I was approaching learning completely. Yeah, I feel like I'm 15 years into this. I've been homeschooling my four for 13 years. My oldest has graduated, but I researched for two years before that. I also got my Bachelor of Science in Nursing before that, and I'm married to someone with postgraduate um, education, and I still I'm in a de-school mindset, just like you are saying. So I can't imagine being taught to teach and then having to de-school that. Well, I didn't start off that way. I think my one and a half year old was doing lap books, like full on, <laughs> <laughs> with the laminator and all of this. And then 
But I was like, this is not going to work. This is not happening. So I love that. I seriously I love that. That's more teachery than I was. And I thought I was good with 830 in the morning, a little bell. And I had my eight month old on my lap, my three year old that was sitting with her little lap book stuff and my two kids doing formal grammar lessons. But that one, that one takes the cake, a year and a half with a lap book. I, I know. I was like, this is what I was supposed to do. And then I realized there was other methods out there. I, I didn't even know that. They don't tell you any of these things in teacher's college. I mean, I heard of Montessori schools, but I didn't know there was like a like hundred different options and that I didn't have to do school at home. And that alone was really eye-opening for us. And so how, does, how did you notice your own sense of self shift over the years or how you saw yourself as um, you know, that formal educator, and then you bring your kids home, and you you were saying that you were challenged by your first, and then you had to figure out how to engage him in a non-schooled kind of way. How did that influence your own sense of identity? I guess. Oh, my own sense of identity had a roller coaster ride over the years because you get so wrapped up as a mom with little ones being mom being mom to these little babies and you forget that you're an actual person yourself. You're just mom. And then I was like, okay, but now I'm supposed to be teacher mom. And and then I'm like, okay, I got to get into teacher mode. And on the side, I also run businesses. So I'm like, okay, but I'm also an entrepreneur. And I forgot who I was. Like all the joy was gone. And that's when we really hit, I think our lowest is when I just was doing everything for everyone else being everyone for everyone else and just not myself. Mm -hmm. So what was the the point that really shifted things for you? Well, unfortunately, I, it was some miscarriages that we had ha been through. And then our family business was struggling. And I was trying to unschool for a bit at the time. And it was just turning into like neglect. I mean, there was no nothing happening because I had nothing left to give is exactly what we're talking about. I just, I had nothing left to give. I was at the end of myself and people were noticing. My neighbors were complaining because it was just all yelling and fighting and screaming. And I had the kids on screens all day because I was dealing with physically my body who was having problems. And my parents were like, you got to put them in school. Like something's got to give. you just, this, you, this is not sustainable. And I had, we put a lot of consideration into what course of change we should do. And we decided that, no, if we can continue homeschooling, that was really important for us as a family. Like we had to pick and choose what we were going to give up. And I thought maybe I could get some parenting help. Maybe, maybe like I, I got to get some help from somewhere. My kids are going crazy. Maybe it's my parenting style. I'll try that first. And if that doesn't work out, then I'll put them in school and we'll figure it out. Thank you. And for I worked that. with, yeah. Yeah, really. So that's when I, I worked that. with some parenting coaches. I did like some online courses and some in person because I needed that accountability. And the transformation in our family was so huge that it's then that I decided that I wanted to offer support for moms that I wish I had when I needed it most. And that's what launched my career as a coach as well. There are so many people that have had stories that are some sort of flavor of that. I, I certainly have. And it probably, the hardest stories usually compel the greatest empathy. So then we feel for other people and we want to make sure that they're supported. But, um, you know, that, that story, your challenging story, I've heard another friend's story similar. Um, she had a bunch of different challenges, you know, clinical depression and marriage challenges and was also falling asleep on the couch in the morning and just called it unschooling and then finally had a wake-up call for herself that uh, this isn't unschooling this is just neglect this is just nothing but it's it's not always discussed because the idea of homeschooling is utopia like we signed up for perfection it's a perfect school it's a perfect socialization scenario for our kids and we'll all live happily ever after that's not going to happen. <laughs> That's just not what? I know. And it's really hard, especially for all these new families coming into homeschooling. Yeah. And I mean, you're the, the thing is homeschooling your home. You're still a family. You still are parenting. And all those parenting challenges don't disappear when the school bell rings. 
because it's a completely different situation. You're not a teacher in authority with other strangers' kids. That's like a totally different thing. You can't just, you know, keep them in for recess or fail them or whatever. You're still a parent. And those challenges come up. You've got kids that just don't want to do your lesson. Well, what are you going to do? With, you know, you got to work out all those parenting challenges in amongst the school stuff as well. Yeah, it kind of feels like parenting on amphetamines, I tell some people sometimes. Or at least there is a value of not seeing your kids for a period of the day. Because when you come back to pick them up at the end of the school day, you're happy to see them. And not that you don't love to see them. I mean... I don't want to give that impression, but when there are those parenting challenges for such a prolonged period, it feels pretty intense and there's no break. So then there's no mental separation. There's no clarity or perspective. And it's harder sometimes to get that perspective. Yeah, that's why I really appreciated the the outside perspective when I did reach out for some help. Like I went to some groups and I was meeting with other moms and and just knowing that I wasn't alone and they're like, no, I totally get that because you get feeling like you're the only one or that you're ashamed. Like I shouldn't be feeling like this. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be frustrated or not loving what's going on around me. And when you talk to other people and you build community, that's really helpful support. It is. And get a little bit of a, a perspective from somebody else. Yesterday I was taught or listening to another podcast um, about a mom who actually does a, a episode or a podcast on homesteading, um, but she also homeschools her kids. And she said that her experience with um, homeschooling her kids and homesteading, the reason she can do it is because she's not as child centric as our culture is, that she just includes them in her activities. And I think there's value in moving away from such a child centric um, focus in our homeschools, which is like really hard to do and not intuitive at all. And you kind of look at it and go, what does that mean? Because you, the point is that you're homeschooling your kids. So you're with your kids, but there's kind of a balance, dare I say, whatever balance means. But um, there's some sort of balance there of engaging and providing for our kids and also taking care of ourselves. Yeah, you can't give if you're on empty. Like you really have to keep your sense of who you are because your children also see that. And everything you're doing as a parent is modeling for them real life. And if you're just giving, giving, giving and making them the center of the world, they can see how weary and exhausted and resentful you are. So you're not doing anyone a favor by thinking that you're doing all these great things for your kids. They need to learn as, when they are adults how to take care of themselves. More so for us, we, yeah. yeah, like we, we include our kids in our business. They know that we run businesses and that these, this is where our priority is right now. This is what's happening. And they learn the ins and outs. And then we talk a great deal about self care. Like the whole family has to take care of the house. I'm not Cinderella. If you, your laundry's not done. Oh, well, you got no clothes. Like, they have to learn how to function. You're not doing your kids any favor by not taking care of yourself or teaching them how to. So how do you take care of yourself or what practices do you incorporate that you might not have done before that time, that crisis time? I didn't take time for myself hardly at all. That's one of the key things was putting myself as a priority and saying, hey, I count. I, I even matter here in this family. Um, one thing I try to do is check in with myself throughout the day because sometimes you get halfway through the day and realize you've never even gone to the bathroom or had a drink of water and then you're snapping on everyone and exhausted and you didn't even care for your own basic needs. So when I first started, I actually set a timer and when it went off, I like, okay, what do I, how am I feeling? What do I need? And as time has gone on, I learned that, you know, I get hangry, so I need to eat. <laughs> and I know that I can sense that. And I've taught my kids to recognize that too, because my oldest really is affected by food. Just, he gets really hungry and then he goes out of control. So I, that's something that we've learned to care for. And then I've tried to also do something enjoyable each day or every few days just for myself and sometimes I'll bring the kids in if I want if I'm in a mood to color well, we can all color we can all dance we can all garden together 
it's not hurting them. <laughs> they can all join in, but I'm doing something that I actually want to do during the day. So what I would really love to learn more about the timer idea that you had. Would you share more about that? Well, okay, so I actually learned that from Dr. Laura Markham. She does AHA Parenting, and so I had taken her course, and one of the things is set a timer. And when the timer goes off, check in with yourself and, and see, like, how am I feeling? What are my needs right now? And just, you know, even just checking in that moment of, okay, I'm fine. But you, you thought of yourself even for a second or if you're thinking, okay, I'm feeling really flustered right now. Because when we think of our feelings, then you can look at the needs behind those feelings and then address those and meet those needs and your feelings change almost instantly. Reframing. That's actually the premise of my Homeschool Mama self-care book is that idea. So it's really cool to hear it in a different package or a different way of saying that. Yeah, and we also try to, like I right now I'm really focusing on modeling self-care and awareness of feelings and needs with my children because it's benefiting me i did i tell the kids the feelings wall that i made on in the house is that actually for me <laughs> but the, i knew that they were going to benefit too so i did all kid like but when i was really trying to change my parenting i wanted reminders for myself and so i put, started posting reminders all over the house of just you know those cute memes and, and quotes you see up and then giving more language wording to the kids. And that's developed into like a whole kids course that I'm now doing with my boys and some families, but just reminding myself that I, everything that I'm doing for myself, I'm modeling and helping my kids. They're way farther along the road than I was as a kid because we never talked about feelings. We never talked about any of this. So affirmations, would that be another way of um, saying that? that? That's something that I identify with as well as, and actually I do that, I really do that quite faithfully in the mornings is read this affirmation list of the things that I want as a homeschool mom or how I want to be. And I know that it's no magic sauce. I'm not gaining, like I'm not magically transported into a different brain, but it's like I'm trying to train myself to think the way that I want to engage my kids. So that's, that's interesting. We have a different way of spinning that. But yeah, I think those memes, those funny memes um, that are out there and or funny or the inspirational memes that are on Instagram or Facebook, they have a lot of traction because they speak to our souls. Exactly. And I, we, for a while, like, you know, you, you, you find that life is like a roller coaster and things are going well. And then I take a nosedive and, but you got to work to get yourself out of the funk. And so when we are in that way, we have affirmations that we read in the morning and then we discuss them at dinner time to talk about, hey, how did that, you know, ours are like, you know, I have, I am kind or I have grit or I have, you know, whatever it is. And we talk about it over dinner. And then the other posters I had on the wall were actually like just reminder ones to like stop and breathe or or talking more about feelings and things with the boys, just to remind myself to, to focus on that type of language. Your first point about um, setting an alarm clock, I, I think of that as like a mindfulness practice. Yeah. Mindfulness how, is a huge How frequently would you set the alarm clock? I'm thinking of all the- Depends on if you're trying to train I'm, yourself or not. Like if it's new for you, I'd set it for maybe every hour or two. Uh, but then as time goes on, I mean, you, you're going to get used to that practice of checking in with yourself. And I think in an hour alarm would annoy me. <laughs> every hour going off, I think I'd get annoyed. So I think I set mine for about every two hours. That's a great practice, especially as new, so many new homeschoolers are coming out or are planning to, you know, try homeschooling in the fall. And uh, they're trying to like plan all the details of their homeschool, just like we did. And uh, it's instinct. And we can tell people not to do that. But the truth is, we're all coming from a schooled scenario, or most of us. And we think in school. And so we want to replicate school. 
But if we, we can encourage new homeschoolers to take that mindfulness practice, like you're saying, or set that alarm clock, then they can stop and say, hey, what's going on inside of me? Why am I feeling like this isn't good enough or my kids not responding the way that I want? And actually look at that and say, is this true? Are you 100% sure it's true? Could there be another way, a different perspective on this? And if there is another perspective, then maybe I could actually choose to flip the script, as my husband says, like change the script in your mind in how you're perceiving something and how you're engaging something so that you can choose how to think and engage the way you want to. Mindset is a huge one. I mean, I even work with a business coach and most of the weeks, it's all about mindset. I mean, the actual doing of something is taking up way less than the brain space it takes to get yourself going. And you were mentioning talking about um, scheduling and, and these timers and things. And you, as a mom, you really also need to schedule a break from yourself, especially if you're an introvert. I mean, extroverts, they might feed off of the energy of having their kids around. But if you're not like that, even if you are, you need to actually put in your day some breathing room. Otherwise you're hiding in the bathroom with the door locked so they can't find you. Right. And then I've said this too, though, don't hide yourself in a bathroom in a locked door because guaranteed 30 seconds and there'll be a knock, knock, knock. <laughs> they have like a GPS thing that just, they know you're in the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. They'll find you. So, but if you plan that as a family, then like I've said, you're, you're teaching everyone to take that downtime and that break. So and it's great if you have nappers, but if you don't, then have a quiet time. Like yeah. throw little kids on a podcast and then take just a mental break in the middle of the day. Even teachers get lunch break or they have, you know, a, a free period. You got to take a mental break and then recharge for the rest of the day. That's right. Yeah. And I find creating a communal quiet time in the afternoon, it's not just great for the kids to read or do whatever quiet activities they want to do, depending on their age, but it gives you a downtime. And your kids, actually, if you start young enough as uh, with homeschooled kids, they know that after lunch for an hour is quiet time. And even when they're teenagers, they know that that's still quiet time. And it's really useful for everybody. The energy comes down for everybody. Well, yeah. And like you said earlier, that, that time apart is important. Because if you're just around each other all day, you get on each other's nerves or they, they drag on a fight they had first thing in the morning way into the evening because they never let it go. But that, that time apart gives you a chance to think, refresh, and then start again in the afternoon. So how do you practically find time alone? or away from the kids, especially in this COVID thing, because I don't know about you, but having had three teenagers at home during COVID, oh, ho, ho. <laughs> all of a sudden I'm worried about homeschool socialization. I never was before, but I am now. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Well, having that scheduled time, podcasts work great for my boys because they're not all strong readers. Um, and, you know, I slacked a little on getting them used to quiet time. Like, you know, it goes in seasons. Uh, they do get some screen time now, a lot more than they did. I know that's a hot topic. We were a lot lighter on the screens before COVID, but um, sometimes screen time can help me a little. And then once they get interested in projects, for us, the summer has helped a lot. Like when the weather's nice, and they just like doing their own thing outside and playing. So like, they're still young enough that that's, you know, sandbox is exciting. Then that's when I can catch a bit of a break too. Well, I know there's a lot of people that are either presently, what do you want to call it? Like quarantining or, or they just are isolating and they have to be like, there's different people around the States or uh, across Canada that have that scenario where they're limited, where they're going or what they're doing. Do you have any ideas what moms can do to actually get away besides locking yourself in your bathroom? Um, making use of any support system you can is important. And if, if you have a, a spouse or a partner, take turns. Even if you just go for a drive or go for a walk or, or something. And for us, I mean, it depends on the age of your children. 
I'm making use of the older kids to help watch the younger ones, even if they're reading a story or playing with them. I can slip out very briefly and have my 12 year old hang out with his brothers. And then we got like one or two families that were actually seeing. So that helps too. So any support system you can get so you can physically get out is huge if you can arrange that. And if not, then learn to sort of <clears throat> take those little ones with you if you have to. But even just getting outside, a change of scenery just changes that whole mindset. So I know that not all parks are open. You can't all just drive to nature. I'm, I'm blessed to live in a forest. And just walking through your neighborhood, but focusing on, you know, that little pretty weed in the cracks or the bird sounds or touch some tree, hug a tree. But for us, like when my boys, the, it was exciting for them at the beginning of quarantine to not be so busy because we had gone a bit excessive on the activities and the social stuff as homeschoolers. I don't think we were ever home to homeschool for a while there. But then it, then they were missing their friends and then it dragged into every day was the same. And there was <laughs> nothing to look forward to and they were actually really getting depressed. Like life, there was no point to it. It was just mom bugging us about chores and schoolwork and waiting for screen time. Like that was all their day was. And it all became a big blur. So we actually had to write, we wrote a list and I said, these are the things we're going to do every day to try and dig back out of this funk. And a lot of it was just exactly what we've been talking about. Mindfulness practices. I was like, we're going to do something mindful, affirmations, yoga, quiet time, whatever it is, we're going to do that. We're going to talk to another human being outside of our family. We're going to like communicate with the outside of the world. <laughs> one of the things was get off the property. And my middle one, he hates going for walks. He ran across the laneway to technically the city sidewalk. And he's like, there, I did it. I said, good, you're done. <laughs> I don't care. You got off the property. Let's do these things. And it was like being kind or do something fun. All these self-care things we take for granted, but it's really helped a lot with their mood because we're, we're focused, like we're putting some effort, conscious effort into it. So you have a unique scenario where you also have businesses, you're working from home. So do you have any tips how to deal with uh, kids and also work from home? There might be a couple people in the fall that have that scenario again. Yes. And it's a, it's a hot topic that I've talked a lot about recently on different podcasts and things is, is how do you work with your kids around you all day? And uh, I think the biggest thing is you got to remember that you're not, it's not a business setting. Like you're going to have to accept that you're home, just like homeschooling at home looks different than school. So you will, I recommend parents first off, Write down your priorities. What are the absolute must-haves that you have to get done in a day? The rest of it is a bonus if you can get to it. And then schedule your day around those must-haves. If you have certain Zoom calls or appointments or, or things that you have to get done. And then try to break it into chunks so that your kids aren't being neglected and ignored all day. And then making sure that you connect with them before you're going to be doing work because that fills their cup and they're less likely to interrupt and bug you as well as making sure they're fed and watered and not having those basic needs that they're going to bug you about. And then it's really a trick about what are they going to physically be doing while you're working and you're needing to be occupied. And that really does depend on the age of the child because you know, they get older and they're a little more independent, but those little ones, the biggest tricks for us was one was to make sure that the safe, the place where you're working would either safe for the kids to be in so that you had like a little play yard or some office supplies that they could play in while you're finishing up or safe from them. So they don't come in and like mess up all your stuff. <laughs> so having like a poster on the door so they know not to disturb you, which I think mine are trying. <laughs> to come in. And then, um, yeah, keeping them occupied, like little kids, the open-ended toys like Play-Doh or painting or sensory bins holds their attention a lot longer than like fixed toys that only do one thing. Even you have to get a bit. 
those are really good ideas. And yeah. you're actually making me think on a couple of those um, for myself. I know that when I put a timer outside my room and have the door closed and it's like 20 minutes or something, then you can come and chat with me after those 20 minutes because my kids are much older, like 11 to 17 at home. Uh, my three at home and they still interrupt me even though the door is open but when they know there's a timer then they're like okay I can talk to her in 20 minutes so that's helpful but those are really good ideas you've obviously had a long time to practice that yeah I've been working from home since they were born we actually gutted a house had a baby and started a business all in the same year wow. so it's been a lot of practice and now and throughout it I've usually been running two businesses so. so tell us about your coaching business. What do you offer people? So I am a parenting and homeschooling coach. I focus a lot of different areas of homeschooling, encompassing um, like positive, gentle parenting techniques to help, as well as emotion coaching and talking about feelings and self-care and self-regulation in parents and kids. So we, right now we like, have been doing a lot with the kids program, but I'm trying to focus more on the moms so that they can teach their own kids. And then homeschooling, obviously I'm a homeschooling mom, so I might as well offer that to families who need that. I have um, like a blog, a podcast, and a support group, and then I'm doing group coaching and individual coaching on all of these different topics. I'll make sure to include all your links on our show notes and ask you at the very end to share what those are. But I just, I would love to hear about any of the unexpected challenges that you've had along the way in your homeschool world. Maybe something that new homeschoolers might expect, they might experience. I know everybody doesn't have the same stories, but. Um, two unexpected challenges. One would be uh, when my kids, I thought that they would always be excited and engaged in the lessons. And I've got one who really resists and finding ways to that he learns like all three kids learn differently. And I kind of wasn't expecting that even though I was a teacher, because I thought, well, they're all my kids they're not coming from different families. So I'm like, Hey, we're all going to do this unit and it's going to be awesome. And look what I found on Pinterest. And I felt like, I hate this. I'm not going to do it. Why are you making me do this? And I'm like, okay. Now, what? I just spent like a week planning. I've got the lemon. Like I've got it all ready. And you're not. So trying to be patient and flexible and creative in, you know, learning how my child learns and what he's interested in, as well as changing my expectations too, because really getting down to the heart of, what is the point of learning? Do they really need to know this exact topic right now? Or is it the point is learning how to learn? And if he really hates this topic, can we do this in another way? So they don't always love what you're planning. And the other unexpected thing was just the reaction from other people. And right now it seems like everyone's a little more accepting of homeschooling, which is great. But when I first started, I got a lot of crazy looks and a lot of negative talk and I had to navigate those feelings because I don't owe it to other people. I'm not doing this for them. That's their issue. And I took a lot for me to get past that and to find my tribe and those who really were going to encourage and support me along the way. Yeah, I think I heard it on a different uh, homeschool podcast. can't remember which one, so I won't quote it, but she said, that stop looking for homeschool support from people that aren't supportive of homeschooling. And I'm like, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. It's not intuitive though, because you kind of want everybody that you love to love your activities or what you're doing. And it's just not always the case. No, it's not always the case, but you know, sometimes they come around and if not, then you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for your kids. And as long as you and your family are cool with it and, and that's what your goal is, then Keep going. What would you say a common myth about homeschool mama self-care might be? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I think a lot of people assume that 
you just love your kids so much that you don't need the self care because you chose to be at home and it's your, you know, you chose this, you chose to be at home. You must love your kids so much. You're all extroverts or, you know, you're all, and it, that's kind of not true. We do need a break. And yes, I chose it, but, and I have my bad days. It doesn't mean that I need to quit. I'm allowed to vent. I'm allowed to be weary. I'm allowed to be tired. I'm allowed to need help taking care of myself, even though I chose this path. And I think that's where our, we try to do too much for ourselves because we feel like we need to take this on. And that's where a lot of those who don't quite understand homeschooling could be a little more supportive. Yeah, you're human. You are also a human. Yeah, that's basically it. I'm human. I can't keep going. I'm not. And I find it's less, you know, I think people really don't think about us as much as we think they're thinking about us. That's something that I've learned, but I definitely think that I'm the least likely to give grace or give myself, you know, freedom or space um, to myself and my expectations of myself are the most unrealistic. So what you're saying really makes sense to me. Yeah, definitely. So presently, what would you say a self-care challenge is for you and how are you approaching it? Um, I think my current self-care challenge is time because I am really busy, but not always productive. So I'm really working on time blocking and lowering my expectations of the day and that to-do list. Like I, I'm carrying it around in my head, but if I actually time block my week or my day and say, okay, today I'm just going to focus on these things. I know I'm going to get the rest of it tomorrow just kind of opens up a lot more space in my mind and I'm not trying to juggle it all. So I think um, just with the change of summer, every time there's a change of season, like our schedule got thrown off because we do school year round, but it's different in the summer and it's hard for me to keep up that summer feeling while running businesses and keeping up the schedule. So I just have to take a look at that and rework that. So Enneagram and different personality profiling systems have really helped me understand me and understand my family members. You sound like you're a type three Enneagram. Are you familiar with that? Am I right or am I wrong? That particular style. I have done those different personality types and, you know, I've done them with colors and um, one of our curriculums, we've been doing a bit of Waldorf over the years. And so they talk about like the caloric and phlegmatic and, all those different types of personalities. So yeah, it's, it's really fascinating to learn about personality types and where you fit in and how that works with interacting with other family members too, because yeah, they're really not all alike. I guessed at that only because I'm probably projecting myself onto you because that is me. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, okay, time blocking? No, but I have like one bajillion things to do right now. So I should just do them all and we'll all be happy even though I'm not going to, you know, be available lunchtime or I'm, you know, something like that. So I, I, I feel, yeah, I get that very closely because my expectation of myself is the most unrealistic usually, but it somehow finds its way to rub off on other people. Yes. <laughs> my boys are noticing that, you know, we're a little more like one parent than another. And I'm like, yes, but you're you. Don't try to copy me, please. That's actually, yeah, that's amazing that they're, they're seeing it that way. Because it's usually, or at least I hear, usually parents are identifying their child as someone more similar to a parent. So that's interesting to hear that your kids have that awareness. Yeah, well, we talk about it sometimes, too, because I'm, I'm purposely trying to not have them you know, because you want them to uh, warm up and talk and communicate well with the parent that they may not be as much alike with. And I don't, sometimes I struggle to really parent or communicate with one or two of the boys that aren't like my personality or the one that is like me the most, we clash. <laughs> so. I am with you, girlfriend. <laughs> too much like me. <laughs> What self-care strategy would you say is the most important for the long-term homeschool mom's satisfaction? For long-term, I think it's one of those daily ones, really. I mean, you can't just do one thing one time, but get creating a habit 
even if you just pick, try a bunch of different mindfulness things, like try yoga, try deep breathing, try meditating, try checking in on yourself. But then when you find something that really clicks and works for you, get into a habit. Because once you have those daily habits, you don't think about it as much. And that's going to carry you a lot longer than scrambling and being like, oh, I forgot about self-care. Like if you regularly get in the habit of self-care, then when you are struggling, you're going to be able to recognize it faster. Yeah, I wish someone had actually told me that right in the beginning, that it's don't just plan for your kids homeschool, but plan for your own self, like how you're going to take care of yourself, create the morning routine or create, which I, by the way, include all the things that you just said, except yoga. For some reason in the last three months, I'm not doing yoga, but um, everything else I include on the regular. And I wish somebody had told me you really need to do these things. Or exercise, like just exercise hard, 20 minutes just to burn off the tension of that child not wanting to sit down to do their page of math. <laughs> because that tension does build up when you have enough days with kids. And there's always one kid that is definitely not interested in doing things your way. And that's fine, because that's not really the point is to give them an education your way. But there's all that parenting stuff that gets you know, can be intense at times, or it certainly is a lot of energy. So burning it off with exercise or creating those morning routines or all the practices you're talking about. I wish someone had told me that before I started. Well, that's the thing that's completely lacking in all the curriculums is that like, people are like, okay, I'm going to homeschool, I need to get the books, I need to get a curriculum to teach my kids. But you forget that you need, you're the, the teacher needs the care too. There's most curriculums don't teach the teacher how to even do this. There are a few that I'm, you know, have memberships too that focus on the mom and how do you bring this to your kid? How do you teach? And then how are you going to actually do this as a teacher? We plan for our kids. We plan their day. We plan all the stuff around what you're going to be teaching them and you forget about planning for yourself. That's right. How are you going to manage it? When are you going to actually do the planning or the prep work? And when is dinner going to happen? If you spent your whole day planning out your kid's day and you get to dinner, you haven't even thought of that. So yeah, you really have to include yourself in your homeschool plan. Amen. Just as a fun wrap up, I wanted to ask you three questions. One is what is an identity that you have that is entirely outside your homeschool mom identity? I am crafty queen. I love sewing. I've made most of my own clothes. I love making all sorts of things for our nature table and knitting and sewing. And I actually used to work at Michael's craft store. And so I got crafty things. That's me. Classic homeschool mom. I am so glad to have finally met you. (laughs) You're the pin schooler, you said. Can we find some of that stuff on your blog to get ideas? Oh, yeah. I, I post about that, especially on like Facebook and I just got in, on Instagram. So I think I have a picture of my nature table with all the little things I've made for the boys on there. A bit of my personal life in with my business, just yeah. so people get to know who I am. I mean, if you want to work with me, you want to know who I am outside of like business as well. So can you tell us what you would do on a fun Friday night? We have family movie night on Fridays and it's been like a long standing thing. So we get out, we have a giant screen that we got actually from a school gym that was closing. So it's like a big projector screen that comes down from the family room and we do like popcorn and pick a family movie. So that's what our- Oh, I love that. Can you put that projector outside and invite the neighbors to have a social distancing party or- (laughs) We could. We actually used to have it propped up like we would use the picnic table, like the outside table as like in a big pole. Now we've actually hooked it to the ceiling, but it's a lot of fun. The boys take turns picking what kind of movies and so much fun. Yeah. So tell me what is your favorite fun self-care strategy just for fun? Coloring. Coloring. (laughs) coloring I like to color I love all those like you know adult coloring books and I just I love the mixing the colors and so coloring is my like little thing that I do just for me 
and the boys join me if they want to, but they were never really into big coloring books and all that. And meditative too, right? Meditative coloring books. Yeah. Oh, nice full set of crayons. That's mine. Don't touch my pencil crayons. Yeah, I love it. I have, like my I have watercolor ones like that too. Um, it has been a real pleasure to chat with you. I would love to hear where, and so that we can let the listeners know where we can find you online. Joyful Mud Puddles. That's my company name. That's my Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. It's all Joyful Mud Puddles and JoyfulMudPuddles.com. And that's where we can find you for coaching as well? That's everything about me. It's all under Joyful Mud Puddles. It was really lovely to chat with you today. You too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me today. I'd love to hear more about who you are. So come on over to my Facebook or Instagram page, Homeschool Mama Self-Care. My goal is to equip you with self-care strategies to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you want to learn more about my course, How to Homeschool 101, or my upcoming book, Homeschool Mama Self-Care, Thrive, Not Just Survive, head over to my blog, www.capturingthecharmlife.com. You'll also find the show notes and links to everything you've heard in this episode there. I hope you and your kids have a charmed week. And until next time, I hope you can turn your challenges into your charms.